Hello and welcome. I'm Lynn Fries, producer of Global Political Economy, or GPE News Talks. Today's guest is Pat Mooney. At the end of this year, 2021, a meeting is being held to rubber stamp a corporate strategic maneuver to take over global governance of the entire world food system, effectively food production, research, and finance. Pat Mooney will be talking about all this in the context of the long food movement and his report, Transforming Food Systems by 2045. The report shows the stakes are high because food systems are being rapidly transformed as food and agriculture go digital. This is the last chance to change course. Pat Mooney is lead author of that report, produced by IPAS Food in collaboration with ETC Group. Pat Mooney is leading IPAS Food's Long Food Movement Project. He's co-founder and executive director of ETC Group that's monitored corporate power in commercial food, farming, and health for over four decades. He's an expert on agricultural diversity, biotechnology, corporate concentration, and global governance. Pat Mooney was awarded the Pearson Peace Prize in Canada and received the alternative Nobel Prize, the Right Livelihood Award. Welcome, Pat. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Pat, from farmers and fishers groups to cooperatives and unions, the long food movement calls on civil society and social movements to unite and collaborate. This is a forceful counterposition to an agribusiness-led transformation of the food systems. Your report, Transforming Food Systems by 2045, maps out what this kind of ground-up collaboration could achieve. And as the title suggests, you're looking decades ahead. So what was the impetus behind that? Well, we, back in 2016, in fact, we began to talk about the need for a a strategy that was not so short-term as it has always been. It can't just be two or three years of thinking. We need to be thinking further down the road. And we were expressing our, our general frustration, many of us in civil society, that we're always trapped into these cycles of funding, which are so short that we really can't do the horizon scanning that's important. So we talked about, well, let's build something different. Let's try to see if we can imagine uh, not just what we would like to have down the road, but how we would get to it. We all have the same kind of dreams of the way we'd like to see the world be, but can we really get there? Can we politically, practically do it? So the exercise of the long food movement was to not just dream of what we want, but really do the politics of it. You know, what's really viable in terms of moving institutions, moving money around to, to, uh, to get where we want to be. The long food movement is for decentralizing control and democratizing food systems as the key to feeding the world, as well as regenerating ecological and other systems vital to people and the planet. You say achieving that will require policy frameworks at every level of governance, from local law to international law, that support and empower smallholder and peasant farmers all over the world. So talk about policy frameworks that have moved in the opposite direction by supporting and empowering agribusiness and the role of agribusiness in getting governments to make those policy choices. For example, what did agribusiness want and get from government, say, back in the days when biotechnology was the then new technology? Uh, back in the even the late 70s and in the 80s, uh, agribusiness was saying, we have a technology here, biotechnology, uh, genetically modified crops, which uh, will feed the 500 million they said at that time there are 500 million malnourished people in the world that would solve that problem they would they would take care of that and that they had the only tools that would actually be able to do it Uh, they said that they needed some help to do it though they needed three things basically they needed um, government regulators to get out of the way give them the freedom to act as they wanted to. Uh, Secondly, they needed to uh, uh, be able to be given uh, regulation, a certain kind of regulation, intellectual property rights over uh, life, over over plants and livestock, so that they they would own it. And uh, so uh, no bad regulations, but the regulations they wanted, which gave gave them more corporate power. And then thirdly, they they needed to uh, uh, turn the public sector uh, researchers in agriculture into basically servants for the private sector. So do the basic work for us and we'll do the rest. 
Just to clarify that third um, point about what agribusiness wanted, uh, was to turn public sector agricultural researchers into servants for the private sector. So this was to get the sort of research they wanted. In other words, research that advanced the interest of high input, chemical intensive agriculture that eventually will feed into profits for the main agribusiness players, so pro-GMO research. The, the, the Green Revolution sort of research we've been hearing about for ever, and, uh, and all, the, all the developments coming out of universities and, and government research stations around the world uh, for agriculture as well. The research money in the public sector and, uh, is, goes into, again, support services for the private sector, basic research for the private sector. What were some real world consequences of this policy framework that agribusiness wanted and got? Take one example. I'm thinking here of corporate concentration in food systems. What happened there? Well, we went from roughly 7,000 private sector seed companies in the world in, when I first got into this work in the 70s um, to where we now have really, what, five or six at the most in many ways, it's really only three or four companies that really control all of, of commercial production of seeds and, and pesticides together. So it's vastly concentrated compared to what it was. So there's been a lot of corporate takeover and buyout activity. Yeah, on a massive scale. I mean, it's been a huge convergence, uh, really started in the 70s and has kept on going. It hasn't stopped. It's, it's, it's transforming itself. Uh, who's doing the converging has been changing over time. When I was first dealing with this, uh, the biggest seed company in the world is Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, they were, they'd bought more than 100 seed companies and they thought they were going to be big in the market. They decided they couldn't do it after a while and they got out of it and, and, and more conventional crop chemical companies took over and bought the seed companies. Now, of course, we're seeing a, a new development where it's the big data companies that are moving in and taking over uh, large sectors of the food system. And you think there's, there's more to come, that this trend shows no signs of slowing down? It's coming because of, again, the, the, the industrial food chain is changing. It's no longer uh, the, the chain with all the links in it that, it used to, that we used to have. Seeds used to be sold and owned separately from pesticides and from fertilizers, and farm machinery companies were stuck in the business of producing tractors. Um, the, the traders and the, the cargills of the world and, and the processors and the retailers were all different folks. Uh, with big data management, and, and the, the, the ability to manipulate not just uh, digital information, but also to, manip to manipulate uh, digital DNA to actually adjust, te technologically computer-wise adjust living materials, makes it possible for the biggest companies with the biggest computers to step in and, and really try to govern the large chunks of the food chain. So seeds and pesticides have become one basically uh, with the farm machinery companies and the fertilizer companies, they could actually just become one big input sector. Uh, the grain trading companies are kind of lost in this, in this whole exercise. They're not quite sure that they've got anything that anyone else wants anymore. Uh, the, the processors and the retailers are coming together more and the big data managers behind all of that, the Amazons and the Alababas of the world, uh, the Googles and, and Tencents of the world, from whether it's China or Germany or, or uh, the United States are um, saying, well, we can actually manage that better than anybody else can. So you, you get Alibaba advising peasant producers in China on how to grow uh, pigs and gardens, as well as how to market their products, as well as setting them up for retail sales in the stores. I've been emphasizing the, the big data managers as the ones who uh, are really at the front of this now and calling the shots and deciding what to do with, with the food system. But behind them, again, are asset management companies, uh, the BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard and so on, who are huge companies. Uh, BlackRock has now more than $9 trillion in, in, in asset management uh, power, uh, an enormous amount of money. And BlackRock has shares in virtually every part of the food chain, every, every significant company in the food system um, is, is it, BlackRock is there. So BlackRock has that knowledge of what's happening. It's sort of like being at a poker game when BlackRock's the only one that can walk around and see what all, all the cards that all the players have. They, they know it all. And they can then make decisions they think are important to make for, for their profit. And they have, again, the, the, a massive control of data, perhaps more than anybody else does, to, to know how to use it most effectively. 
So in going digital, food and agriculture is generating massive data and with it massive profits for food and the non-food corporations like data platforms, asset management firms and others that moved in on food uh, to get control of those data and profit flows. And with consolidation and concentration, mega corporations can amass vast profits. It's, it's a very profitable enterprise, really. It, it's, uh, food is something that you do three times a day, if you're lucky. And uh, it, it, it's something where you're, you're shopping for all of the time. So it's, it's, your, your repeat buying is, is built into the, into the idea of it. And that means a lot for the companies. It means an awful lot of data can be gathered. Uh, you can attach things to that, uh, as you see with grocery stores that have bigger and bigger uh, other you know, areas of merchandise beyond food and so on. Uh, there's lots of ways you can build from a food base to to control more of the retail markets. Um, but also, of course, with big data management, you control the production side much more easily. It's possible to go to farmers and say, um, if you take this package of, of inputs that we own and control and have proprietary rights over, and we can monitor that for you, we can help you understand the weather, understand the markets, deciding exactly how much fertilizer, how much of pesticides, what seed varieties you should be using. They can control all that package of information and then attach that even to, to uh, crop insurance and sell that to the farmers. So you end up with um, a company like John Deere, uh, for example, as a, the world's largest farm machinery company, having the, the sensors on its tractors, on its combines, that really let it uh, control the entire production process. John Deere is in the field at the beginning of the growing season, planting and uh, dumping in the fertilizers, and the pesticides. It's there uh, at the end of the growing season, picking up the harvest. So it's, it's knowledge of what's being produced and what will make it to the marketplace is, is vast and much stronger than any other company. From seed sector consolidation in the 1980s into the present, you've charted a trend of rising corporate concentration and control in food and agriculture since agribusiness got the policy framework it wanted. You pointed out policymakers embraced what agribusiness wanted on the back of promises made by agribusiness. At that time, promises that biotechnology, so genetically modified crops, would solve problems like world hunger. You debunked agribusiness promises then, and you debunk them now. And as an expert on corporate strategies, you demonstrate agribusiness has a narrow focus that puts profit before people in the planet and systems vital to their well-being, the ecological system, the knowledge system, the social system. Your early work exposing the Terminator seed being an iconic example of how that works. Tell us something about that and read throughs into the present. Well, Terminator was um, something we worried about uh, even back in, in uh, the, in the 1980s that as we saw biotech developing, we, and it wasn't doing well, it was slow in getting into the marketplace. And when it got into the marketplace in the mid 1990s, it ran into a lot of opposition. And, it, you know, it's a matter of just following the money. It's something you know about it. It's uh, uh, paying attention to, to where the greatest profit is. And the biggest profit was going to be if farmers couldn't save their seed if they were prevented from saving their seed. Now, there are legal preventions, of course, that you can apply through patents, but uh, that doesn't work as well in such a decentralized world of, of producers. And so what, uh, what the companies dreamt up was, was an idea of what they called a technology protection system, TPS. And it was a system which they described literally as being a way to help the farmers of South Asia have access to the best possible seeds and technologies uh, in a way which assured the companies who produced those technologies that they wouldn't be robbed, that the farmers wouldn't steal the technologies. So that meant the seed had to be developed in such a way that it would die at harvest time. They'd be able to take the, the, those seeds to, to give you the end product, but the seeds would die at harvest time so they couldn't be planted again. So farmers would have to go buy, back to the companies and buy seed every year. They call it technology protection system. We called it terminator seeds. And uh, there was such a reaction against that that the United Nations came down with a, with a moratorium against Terminator technologies. Uh, the companies themselves were forced 
to publicly say that they wouldn't use the technologies, the biggest companies, and that's held out. They, they have not used the technology. It hasn't been deployed into the marketplace, but they did an end round, run around that again. And, and we realized they would, but by the end of the 90s, we were saying that, that uh, well, what they really want to have is not genetically modified crops. They want to have crops that, that um, will react to uh, chemical use or can be changed internally. You don't need to have uh, um, uh, genes move from one species to another. Uh, you actually just simply change the, the DNA itself within the existing species. And that's now what we call gene drive technologies, where you can go in and you can edit the DNA of, of a plant variety or a livestock species and alter it as you wish. And there's no GMO involved as we traditionally know it. Uh, so that's that's the next step of, of that control. And and they are trying to get that into the marketplace. They're saying that we can't have food security without it. They're applying that to both health and to the food systems. It works in both cases, to malaria, for example, getting rid of insects. Uh, that's, that's, that's part of, of, of the approach they're now taking. And again, we don't know whether it will work. Uh, we don't know if, if it does work, for the, whether it will work too well, be too dangerous, uh, what its longer term implications will be. And we certainly know that we will not be the ones that control it. Pat, in your report, you lay out two very different approaches to technology that as they run their course over the next few decades would map into two very different futures for food. In a nutshell, can you explain that? There's two ways of looking at how they approach technologies, I suppose, or how we're looking at technologies. And I'm making this uh, probably quite unfairly simplistic. Uh, but on one side, we have high tech. And the companies are saying they're the high tech gurus. They know how to, how to handle this. They can go into their labs and they can do at the nanoscale, literally, uh, change life, change DNA, uh, manage systems in such a way that they can apply those, those lab-based technologies to the world on a macro scale. And against that high tech approach, we have what I would described as a wide tech approach, which is where you have production of food and systems at the level of, of uh, uh, watersheds, at the level of, uh, of um, ecosystems, where peasants produce food uh, and, and make changes, create innovation, but innovation which is set in the very specific narrow context, the, the, the nano context of their community or their, their farm area. Uh, so one is, is wide in the sense that it deals with everything in that ecosystem, but but focused on the farm. And the other one is is high in the sense that it has small small innovations that can have global global applications. And and I think the world is much much safer if we have a system where where uh, the, the innovation comes from the 350 million labs that are farms around the world and the hundreds of millions more of, of scientists who are the, the producers around the world who can really be innovative with 7,000 different crops, not with uh, the 12 crops that the companies work with, with, with 38 different livestock species, not the five that the companies work with, to get us through the problems of climate change and the threats of new pests and diseases and so on, and biodiversity loss to, to, to uh, have a decentralized system of, of short, short supply chains. To me, that's what makes sense for the future. So for the common good, for you, what makes sense is policy frameworks that support and empower small farmers and peasants all over the world. So from local to global, that would reset the trajectory of food production, research and financing systems to put people on the planet before profits. As you explained earlier, under agribusiness as usual, the opposite policy framework has prevailed for decades. Knowing that, I was quite surprised to see you report smallholder production has performed so well. It was even a bit of a surprise for us as well. We knew that it was a lot. We didn't realize how much it was. And it's, um, but conservatively speaking, again, uh, uh, peasant production, smallholder production, and that's fisheries as well as livestock keepers, as well as, 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 as farmers um, together. Uh, urban and and uh, rural production 
Uh, there's a lot is being produced in urban areas as well. If we put that all together, then about 70% at least of the world's people depend upon that, that smallholder production to, to stay alive, to, to feed themselves. And that also comes out to roughly the same percentage in terms of the amount of food, not just the number of people, but also the amount of calories and so on that are being produced. Um, and which really begs the question of what are the other guys doing? Uh, what's agribusiness doing? Uh, they, in a sense, they're not doing very much. They're, they're feeding perhaps 30% of the world's people. Uh, they're doing that with uh, more than 75% of the world's land and resources, water, etc., cetera, and the, 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 the food would use. They're causing tremendous environmental damages and they're creating amount of overconsumption of food because so much of the food in, in the industrialized world, at least, goes to overconsumption, which causes health and environmental damages. Sum up briefly why you say history shows agribusiness has promised a lot and given a little. And on the back of that, what it's promising today. Well, industry hasn't been successful. Agribusiness hasn't done what it said it was going to do. Its promises from the 1970s with biotechnology, um, its uh, claims around uh, its capacity to manage the, the uh, inputs to deal with long supply chains, uh, none of that has worked. And it's manifestly true even to governments that, that they recognize that, that, that so the promises haven't haven't proved to be valuable or, or, or to work for society. So industry is, is struggling at this stage, trying to figure out what it does about that. Uh, how do they uh, make the case now that they, they can, they, they've learned their lessons and can, can uh, come up with something which, which really works for, for, for governments and for, and for people who want to eat food. Um, and th they do that, of course, by claiming um, that they're really kind of doing what agroecology is doing, uh, that they have regenerative agriculture. And the language they, they grab onto is, is that we get the message, we're going to move towards uh, climate smart agriculture. We're going to work towards systems which have a full life cycle attached to them from cradle to cradle production. We've understood those messages and we're doing it ourselves, but we're attaching to that and improving it by having big data management, by uh, having our, our highly sophisticated supply chains, by using blockchains to track commodities from the field to the, to the uh, table. They're, they're capturing the language of, of uh, the, what was called the organics movement, now the agroecology movement. They're renaming it, calling it regenerative agriculture. And they're uh, just saying they're gonna tweak it with their proprietary technologies to make it better. As we're now, of course, moving towards what's going to be a food summit uh, at the end of 2021, they're saying they will accept that all of these systems of different of agriculture can live together. It's possible for um, agroecology and peasant producers to be side by side with uh, larger farms and, and it, the industrial processes of agriculture. Um, on the other side, of course, uh, civil society, La Via Campesina, the world's largest uh, umbrella of peasant organizations, and, and others are saying that we can't do this thing side by side. Uh, if you're using pesticides, you're using synthetic fertilizers, if you're managing the marketplace uh, for your purposes, uh, that destroys our livelihoods and our ability to, to feed the 70% of the people that we are feeding. In this context, the report warns food security is under threat from agribusiness if governments rubber stamp what agribusiness want. You've explained even governments now recognize the technological solutions for world problems promised by agribusiness have not worked out or been of value to society. You talked about how in moving towards the summit at the end of the year, that's the UN Food Systems Summit, to make a convincing case its new technologies are of value to society, agribusiness has reframed its promises. I'll just quickly quote a comment um, on that point and on what agribusiness wants in return for those promises um, at the summit. This is from an interview you did at the launch of your report. Agribusiness has a very simple message. The cascading environmental crisis can only be resolved by powerful new genomic and information technologies that they argue can only be developed if governments unleash the entrepreneurial genius, deep pockets, and risk-taking spirit of the most powerful corporations. To do this, the world needs a new governance model, a multi-stakeholder roundtable where governments, companies, and civil society reason together. 
If the summit embraces this governance model, companies say they'll be able to apply artificial intelligence, big data management, digital genomics, robotics, and blockchain-driven supply systems to sustainably feed two billion more mouths a quarter of a century from now. So, Pat, in return for those promises, uh, agribusiness wants the UN Food Systems Summit to embrace a new governance model, the multi-stakeholder model. So that means a UN stamp of approval to shift UN institutions in food and agriculture, so the existing governance structure of the world food system, to the multi-stakeholder model of governance. I should note for viewers that multi-stakeholder institutions promote the multi-stakeholder model as a vehicle to reset the world system of global governance. A leading multi-stakeholder institution, as reported in other segments, is the World Economic Forum. And these multi-stakeholder institutions are funded by the world's most powerful corporations and philanthropic capitalists like the Gates Foundation. Pat, to unpack all this for us, start with some of your thoughts on the multi-stakeholder model. That's the model that we've seen. I mean, we, the world has woken up a little bit because of the COVID uh, experience that we have COVEX, which is the uh, construction of the, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation together with Welcome Trust and where they've, they've said, let's have a multi-stakeholder group that brings together the pharmaceutical industry that are gonna produce the, the vaccines. Um, uh, that they should be there with those who are going to give the money to make this thing work. So that's going to be the, the foundations, the big the, um, uh, philanthropic capitalist foundations. And we have to have the governments who are going to give money as well. We'll sit at the table. We'll invite WHO to be there as an advisor. So you have this facade of the world's governments participating in this process, but they're not really decision makers in it. And, and that those with the money and those with the technologies will make the decisions about how to distribute vaccines around the world, which has not worked very well for the vast majority of humanity. It may not work well for humanity for, for years to come. So the world has seen that as a multi-stakeholder model, but we're seeing that multi-stakeholder model also being proposed in the context of agricultural research, in the context of how to restructure again, the UN's normative functions for food and agriculture and investment and food aid and so on. They're saying that that's that kind of model is what they want to put in place there. Yeah, we're, we're seeing the corporations making their, through the World Economic Forum in particular, saying, here's how we want to restructure the food system uh, in terms of its institutions at the United Nations level. Uh, here's how we want to change the control of big data and manage big data for food and agriculture in our way. And here's how we want to take agricultural research the, through the, uh, the international uh, research body, the, the consultative group on international agricultural research. And here's how we're going to change that to uh, work for ag agribusiness and for the world, they say. And it comes down to this, this language of multi-stakeholderism, uh, which I think is uh, the most insidious and dangerous uh, concept that we've seen in, since World War II in terms of how the world will govern itself. And companies are fundamentally saying, let's all reason together. Let's all just sit around together and we'll just talk these things out and sort out how best to do things in the future. We, we have to recognize that we're all stakeholders here at the table together so let's talk. And their definition of that is that we need governments at the table, of course, because they finally have normative functions. We need to have the industry at the table because they got the money and the innovative capacity. We need to have civil society at the table to sort of keep everybody honest. But of course, the civil society that they want at the table are kind of store-bought civil society, the ones that the companies have built themselves uh, and funded themselves um, to, to be there, uh, who have been co-opted into the system. And they're really there for almost camouflage purposes. The real negotiation is not multi-state it's, it's a negotiation between governments and corporations. And how will we, how will the governments facilitate what the corporations say they need to have, the resources they need to have and, and the regulatory systems they want to put in place to let them do their, what they say is their job as corporations. And, and, and so it's, it's a complete falsity to call it multi-stakeholderism. And that's just a, such a false description of, of the reality uh, of the world that, that um, we think it has to be rejected. In other words, under that false description of the reality of the world that you were talking about, powerful corporations are positioning themselves to directly call the shots on how the world will be governed. And as the vehicle for this is multi-stakeholderism, it's not so hard to uh, understand why you reject that model. 
Your long food movement report maps out what the next 25 years have in store if agribusiness as usual gets the multi-stakeholder model of global governance that it wants. And what that mapping shows is the keys of the food system are handed over to data platforms, private equity firms, e-commerce giants, putting the food security of billions at the mercy of high-risk AI-controlled farming systems and accelerating environmental breakdown. Our conversation today is not so much to talk about the nitty-gritty of the dystopian future for food, people, and the planet mapped out in the report. It's about how to prevent it. In other words, prevent the corporate takeover of global governance of the world food system by means of the multi-stakeholder model. So in the time we have, talk to us about immediate threats of this. You point to three big agribusiness plays on structures of global governance of food and agriculture being pursued right now in 2021. Those being the 2021 UN Food System Summit, a play to get the summit, and so the UN to mandate an embrace of the multi-stakeholder model for governance of food and agriculture. And the other two fronts want to play on global governance on big data in food and agriculture, and thirdly, agricultural research. So let's take them one by one in reverse order. So first, the play on agricultural research. You talked earlier about how from the 1980s, agribusiness got major governments to turn their public sector research institutions into a servant for the private sector, so agribusiness. The play in 2021 is to turn the world's international public agricultural research institution into a servant for agribusiness. That research body is the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, or CTIAR. So who's spearheading that? It really is. I mean, it's the Gates Foundation uh, together with uh, people who used to work, at least for the Syngenta Foundation, which is now Sinochem's property, um, uh, with the UK government and the US government, uh, a couple of others who are saying that we need to create a public international public sector research body, which really is working hand in hand with the biggest private sector companies to deliver food security in the future. And it's only the biggest companies that actually have the technologies again and the money for those technologies that can get us out of this mess. So in the past, whereas the CGIR organization, which I'm a critic of, by the way, historically has not been a great organization, but still it was trying to do something in theory for the South and collaborating with governments in the South. Now that that body will really be a body which says, here's what we want to do to you guys. Uh, if you want our money and our technologies, then you've got to go along with what we recommend to you. It's really COVAX all over again, but for agriculture. It is the, 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 uh, the biggest companies with the biggest money pockets saying uh, you can have our vaccines or you can have our, our food technologies, but only under our conditions. And, and that kind of control is really, I think, quite scary. And, and that's what they are pursuing. On your point that this play is COVAX all over again, but for agriculture, as we can't go into that here, I'll just point out a, a, for viewers a good resource for finding out more about COVAX and so read-throughs to other sectors can be found online. It's a report by Harris Gleckman called COVAX, a global multi-stakeholder group that poses political and health risks to developing countries and multilateralism. So Pat, to get back to your comments about the world's international public uh, sector agricultural research body, CGIAR, the plan tabled, as I understand it, was for so-called unification of the CGIAR system. Corporate framing you decode is meaning turning the system into a single corporate entity with stronger than ever connections to agribusiness. So what's the state of play there and has this CGIAR unification uh, been achieved? Yes, and again, there's, there's counter trends to it as well. That's what they're doing. They've achieved it. They've actually amalgamated the 15 institutes that, that are part of the CGIR system into one. Uh, they, they've uh, they gained the controls they want. They're streamlining their technologies and research. They're pushing out any smaller enterprises and marginalizing uh, scientists in the South to be involved in their own food systems. They've, they're doing that. But um, they're still stuck with a legal structure 
which is grounded in about 14 different countries around the world, uh, that any one of those countries can treat what's happening as a kind of merger as they would any other merger and acquisition and could stop it. And there are many good reasons why, for example, Peru or the Philippines or Mexico, uh, who have these institutes in their own territory, could step in and say, no, 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 this, this, we're not allowing this merger to happen. And under the headquarters agreements, which exist now and have existed for some time, those countries could literally take over those institutes and make them national property, bring them entirely into the public sector of that country. So all you need to break, stop this, this takeover of agricultural research is to, to have two or three countries just say no to it. And that I think is what we need to be pursuing in the uh, discussions leading up to this food summit. We need to say, governments recognize you have power here, exercise that power or you'll never have it again. You'll lose control. So Mexico then is, is one of the key countries in this. And Mexico, of course, has been under intense pressure from agribusiness since by presidential decree, they banned uh, glyphosate and GM corn. Absolutely. I mean, Mexico is where the international center for the production of maize and wheat takes place in the world. It's right there in Mexico, just outside of Mexico City. If Mexico says that our headquarters agreement has been violated by this takeover uh, by, by uh, uh, the Gates Foundation and friends, then they can step in and, 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 and take over all of those resources, including the gene bank with the enormous diversity of maize and wheat seed in the, in the gene bank and say, now it's, now it's the property of Mexico and we'll cooperate with the rest of the world, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna surrender to this private sector initiative. Let's move now to uh, another of the immediate threats to global governance of the world food system from agribusiness-led plays for a shift to multi-stakeholderism. Earlier, you talked about the massive data and profit flows being generated as food and agriculture go digital. So this play has to do with control over global governance of data in food and agriculture, specifically the creation of an international digital council for food and agriculture. So tell us about this. First of all, is it already a done deal? No, it's not. It's still up for discussion. I think it's encouraging that while uh, uh, we know what the companies want to achieve here, they want their multi-stakeholder group to make the decisions for that, uh, the German government has stepped in and said, uh, we got to look at this more closely. And they've gone to the United Nations, to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, and they've said, we need you to set up the government structure for this. And this has to be a discussion with the world's governments. So while there is a, a tendency to, to, to push in the same direction that they have with the World Health Organization, marginalizing it and giving it sort of a, a cameo appearance in the, in the process. I think there's still a hope uh, that uh, the Digital Council could be one which is, is an intergovernmental body and which is a, a negotiated process with peasant producers around the world as well as with the governments to, to decide what should be done. It's not too late. I am worried that the Secretary General in New York has created this wider digital body that's looking at the use of digital information in every sector of the economy outside of agriculture as well. And uh, they've surrendered that process to a multi-stakeholder group led by the biggest companies. But there still is a subsector around food and agriculture that's being negotiated, and there's still some hope that we uh, can uh, protect the interests of, of uh, the food insecure and the food producers. So then global governance of data in every sector of the economy outside of agriculture has already been surrendered to a multi-stakeholder group. And that group's a body proposed by the UN Secretary General. I should note for viewers that body's been dubbed Big Tech Governing Big Tech in a civil society campaign to get it revoked by the UN Secretary General. And that in several other contexts, civil society continues to call on the UN Secretary General to rescind and desist from actions that surrender the UN multilateral system to multi-stakeholderism. The classic case of the role of the UN Secretary General in normalizing multi-stakeholderism inside the United Nations was his signing of the United Nations World Economic Forum Strategic Partnership Agreement in 2019. Other experts that I've interviewed report how that agreement was signed without internal discussion among UN member states or public debate. 
As reported by Transnational Institute at the time, an open letter sent to the UN Secretary General by over 400 organizations denounced the agreement for formalizing the corporate capture of the United Nations. In this conversation, we've been talking about three big agribusiness plays bringing the threat of multi-stakeholderism to food and agriculture. And you say when taken together, put the entire structure of the UN multilateral food system on the table in 2021. So far, you discussed two. The remaining play is the UN Food System Summit. And as context reviewers, I'll very quickly note that this summit was convened by the UN Secretary General. And as envoy to the summit, the UN Secretary General appointed a recognized proponent of multi-stakeholderism and that of agribusiness. That envoy, Agnes Kalabata, is a member of the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council, now known as the World Economic Forum Global Future Council. She's the president of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA. A letter addressed to the UN Secretary General signed by 176 organizations working in Africa and their allies called on the UN Secretary General to revoke that appointment to no avail. In your words, the summit is the brainchild of the World Economic Forum. So comment now on the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit. It, it's really uh, a shocking uh, move. Uh, we were we felt that there was a need for a, a food summit uh, and one that really looked at the architecture of how food and agriculture services are dealt with around the world, but not one, this, uh, not the one that's being talked about by the World Economic Forum, again, which is this sort of multi-stakeholder strategy for governance, which is be behind the scenes sort of. Um, and the, the response has been from the World Economic Forum and those who are pursuing the summit uh, from the Secretary General's office is to say, well, it's really going to be a people's summit. We're going to open up to absolutely everybody. Uh, it, it, I've likened it to being, it's not a, they call it the, the World Food System Summit. Uh, to me, it's much more like a Disney World Food System Summit. Uh, you can go to the, you can go to the park. Uh, you can get on any of the rides you want to. The rides are bright and colorful. There's Never Never Land. There's Frontier Land. There, there's uh, what, what else they have there. Um, all of those fantasy places can, you can go to. Uh, but when you go on the ride and have a, enjoy the ride, you end up exactly where you uh, started when you get off it. Uh, nothing has changed. So we're all going to be on this ride moving towards the Food System Summit. Um, but at the end of the day, it will only be those who are managing the process who will be able to interpret what came out of the process. So much will happen. There'll be so much discussion in so many different areas. And there is no effort to actually create a final decision-making process where governments say, here are the conclusions. It'll be up to the organizers, organizers to say at the end of the day, here's what we interpret to be the conclusions. Here's what we've picked out of this wonderful sort of uh, uh, potpourri of activities that went on here. And, and uh, that's the scary part because they know what they want already and they will, they will claim that they got it and they're, they're welcoming all the noise and fanfare and activity along the way, but, but they, they decide. There's been significant press coverage reporting controversy and protests surrounding the summit, including out and out calls for a boycott. I found it especially interesting to see the summit criticized in letters and statements, not just from civil society and social movements, but also UN insiders and UN independent experts. For example, Ibis Foods, Olivier Duchuda, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, and former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Yes, and uh, Olivier and, and others have tried to give it a chance. Have, have, uh, we all in, in IPIS Food, we felt that we should, you know, at the very beginning of the process, we were invited to be involved. We agreed to be involved um, to at least see if it could go somewhere. It, we're giving it a best effort. Um, I think there's a, an overwhelming recognition now from uh, those in civil society and academia that have have tried to to, to participate that that is not working, and uh, I think there will be an exodus away from the summit. And I say that with with um, 
knowing that uh, having been around the UN for more than half a century, um, the UN can paper over almost any disaster and governments are very good at making disasters look okay. Uh, this is such a disaster in its organizational processes that I'm not sure it can survive it. Uh, I don't think anyone's gonna be able to paper over this, this mess. For me, one statement in particular really seemed to capture a lot of what we've been discussing today, and that was a statement made by the world-renowned economist and a former assistant undersecretary general at the United Nations, Jomo K.S. He wrote, Big Ag claims that the food, ecological, and climate crises has to be addressed with its superior new technologies, harnessing the finance, entrepreneurship, and innovation only they can offer. But in fact, they have failed, instead triggering more problems in their pursuit of profit. As the new food system and corporate trends consolidate, it will become increasingly difficult to change course. Very timely, a long food movement is an urgent call to action for the long haul. You still seem to think the long food movement can get to where it wants to be by 2045. That in other words, it's not too late to turn things around. I'm an optimist. I think it's probably um, uh, uh, in my genes to be optimistic, and I'm, I'm sure someone will offer to gene edit me to get it out of me. But I, I do think that that um, we're not too late in this. Uh, again, the surprise for us was that civil society is doing better and moving better than we thought, uh, is more coherent than we thought they would be. They've got to do more, but it is possible. And the other surprise is that, again, 70% of the world's food system is produced by smallholder producers, not by the big corporations, as much as they'd like you to think otherwise. The reality still is that 70% of the world's people are living from the, the, the bounty and, and the work of peasant producers, fishers and, and others around the world who are, who are getting the food on the table. So that we've got the majority of it still. There is still an enormous amount of diversity beyond that which is held by science, which peasants have in their fields. They, they've been saving their own seeds. They've been nurturing their own diverse livestock. They're working again with 7,000 crops with much more diversity than, than the industry is, is working with. I mean, just compare this one figure, which I think explains it a lot. About 45% of all agricultural research in the private sector focuses on one crop, corn or maize, one crop. Farmers are working again with 7,000 crops. So uh, if you're trying to survive climate change, who do you want to trust to get you through it? You know, you're just going to eat popcorn the rest of your life or are you going to be able to, to uh, in climate change, or are you going to be able to, to have that diversity of foods that, that can get us through different growing conditions and different pests and diseases? So there's a lot still on the side of the peasant producers. Pat Mooney, thank you. No, thanks for having me. And from Geneva, Switzerland, thank you for joining us in this segment of GPE News Talks.